Greetings Valparaiso, this is Ken the Metal Professor and you are listening to Mostly Metal here on WVLP. And this is a rebroadcast of the Mostly Metal show from Sunday night, April 30th. Although it isn't a true rebroadcast, this is basically take two. Um, if you would managed to catch some of it live, you heard Larry Roberts uh, from November's Doom was my special guest in the studio. And we recorded an awesome, probably the best two-hour radio show that's ever been broadcast anywhere. Uh, and you missed it. And unfortunately, so did we, kind of. I forgot to hit record. Uh, and so we are going to try to recreate some of, the, some of the talking and some of the information Larry was giving us about the music that we're going to play. And that music is basically the entire CD, Hamartia, which is the brand new disc from November's Doom and we'll throw in a few extra songs in between. So Larry, welcome back to the show. Hey, I feel like I was just here. <laughs> Deja vu. Um, <laughs> hope the chair is comfortable and uh, yeah. <laughs> and we'll see what we can do here. Now, it occurred to me that um, since we have a second crack at this, maybe we should set the stage, so to speak, a little bit. Uh, I don't think we did this the first time around, but we are going to listen to all the tracks off of the new November's Doom CD. And for people that have not heard of November's Doom before, who is November's Doom? Um, well, I mean, without going into a really long, drawn-out thing, I mean, November's Doom was essentially a band started out of Chicago by our vocalist and founder, Paul Kerr, way, way back in the Dark Ages, otherwise known as 1989. <laughs> um, and uh, the whole... Uh, the whole purpose of the band really was musical purpose that is was to um delve into dark forms of metal and when i say that i mean just like you know not any one particular genre it doesn't have to be doom metal doesn't have to be death metal or power metal or prog metal we we kind of we blend all of it together and we just but we mainly draw upon the darker side of it and um i ended up joining the band around early 1999 so i've been stuck in this uh this dark prison for years <laughs> now my own self and um you know yeah we've got the hamartia is our 10th album you know it, we it took us almost 30 years to do 10 albums because we don't like to rush things <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know, yeah, we're just we're still kicking it, man. We're still we're still doing this and uh, still uh, still trying to find new territory and new ideas and and you know delve into new little nooks and crannies of this whole little dark metal thing that we've uh, cultivated here. And I think with Amartya, you know, I I think not to be big on it, but I think we've you know succeeded we're still we're still plowing along man we're doing good that's great and how, why did they let you wait i shouldn't phrase it like that how how did you end up joining the band <laughs> i actually i mean i've been playing in bands since uh the early mid 80s you know I, when i was a, when i was literally a kid and um i was familiar with Paul and the November's Doom guys for years. My old bands used to play with them, and some of my old bandmates had been in and out of November's Doom prior to my joining. I was like the holdout, you know. I, I was like the last guy. You know, I just refused to join this stupid band for the longest time. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it just like you know, in all seriousness, you know, it, lives just finally intertwined at the right time. Um, I was in the, in the late nineties, I was, uh, I'd been out of the music scene for the most part for a few years by my own accord. And I was ready to get back into it, but I didn't want to just do the same old things. A lot of people might remember in the United States, the metal scene was a little bit of a, a troubled time, you know, there in the nineties, um, so I was real particular about what I wanted to do, and then it just so happened that uh, Doom was getting ready to put out the second record, which was of Sculptured Ivy and Stone Flowers. They literally just finished recording it, but knew that their lead guitar player was going to be moving on. So they actually reached out to me and said, you know, are you interested? Are you ready to get back into it and start playing again? 
And when I heard what the band was doing, I, I in you know, instantly, because they had grown so much from that first record to the second record, I knew that this was the right thing for me. And uh, I always loved how progressive November's Doom was, in addition to being dark and heavy and brutal and all those other things. So it, it worked perfectly for me, and I've been here ever since. That's great, and I think the word progressive does apply. I mean, when some people hear progressive, they're going to think Dream Theater, right? And, you know, 20-minute 20, right. 20 opuses laden with, with keyboards and things like that. And the way I apply it to you guys is that if from disc to disc to disc, there's always some kind of evolution and progression, right, in terms of what you right. guys are doing. It's always still recognizably the same band, but there's, there's growth all the time. Right. And, and I mean, and there's a lot of progressive influences in what we do in terms of like, I mean, yeah, I know people are going to think of, uh, dream theater and things like that, like you said, but to me, progressive music was always things like early Genesis and Mm -hmm. yes. And even to a lesser degree, though, I wouldn't call them progressive, you know, what bands like Led Zeppelin were doing, or of course, Pink Floyd. I mean, to me, progressive has something more to do with just um, writing songs that are memorable and meaningful, but but going beyond just the standard songwriting fare right. and rules. And that's kind of always been us. I mean, I think we're a little bit, uh, we're deceptive in that people hear some of our stuff and think, oh, you know, this this is pretty straightforward or it's catchy it doesn't seem that complicated but then if we found i've had fans come to me and say man how do you play some of these songs because when they actually sit down and try to learn our stuff it's a little more complex than they realized and i said well that's oh, that's yeah. the pro- that's the progressive nature in it you know uh-huh. what i mean it's it's not that we're playing everything in nine eight time it's that you know there's a complexity there right and in, in terms of what some of your influences are, one of the things that you've done is made a small selection of, of some of the groups that and, and artists that you have kind of said have influenced you along the way. And some of them are kind of surprising. And later on in the show, we'll, we'll hear a couple of those selections. Um, but for right now, we'll go into the first three tracks off of Hamardia, and they're called Devil's Light, Plague Bird, and Ghost. Um, there's ten tracks all together, so these are the first three and what's uh, how do you how do you make those choices about what goes where well they're they're usually pretty they come to us uh pretty easily i think when we're writing these songs i they it's it's not that we sit down and necessarily have to analyze it too deeply i mean for example the first song in the album devil's light when we wrote it uh, as soon as we were in the thick of it and it was becoming a full fully fleshed song we sort of looked at each other and said yeah this this almost certainly is going to be the opening track on the album i mean just the intro of the song itself before we even knew where the vocals were going to go or anything it just lended itself to being the perfect album opener it has a certain feel to it it you know i feel like that song sort of uh like i've talked about it before i I have always well paul and myself have always based our uh album structuring on the classic stuff that influenced us especially things like the classic metallica albums when you listen to albums like ride the lightning or or even especially master of puppets and you look at the way like battery comes in and sets up a certain mode and, and and it gets it gets everybody worked up and then the second song is like the opus which is master of puppets i kind of feel like that's how we did it with this album because you've got devil's light that really just starts the engine and revs the engine and gets you on the road and then plague bird is a song i'm very proud of i think it's one of the best songs we've ever done and it's it's an opus i mean it's it the the moods that it sets the I just think that that song especially kind of represents this album and really sets the mood for the whole album. It's heavy, but it's dark. It's It's got the blend of the heavy vocals and the clean vocals. Um, there's aggression, but there's sorrow there. There's it, It's got all the emotions. So that just seemed to me like the perfect 
second track to to really get you that's when you've taken off the runway and now you hit the air um and then ghost being sort of in the uh again keeping with the metallica being in sort of the <laughs> the thing that should not be position or whatever there you go uh the monster ghost, song yeah the ghost is um you know that was a song that we'd originally planned to have later in the album uh that was the only song that actually changed places from what we originally had planned we we originally thought another song was going to be in the third position but as ghost became more and more fleshed out uh especially once the vocals and everything got added i really made a strong suggestion that we move that up to that third position because i had a feeling that was going to be one of the stronger songs on the album and that people were really going to react well and i can pat myself on the back <laughs> a little bit and say that that's true i've we've had a great response to that song um it's a it's a great one to play live we've done it live now a little bit which we'll probably talk about later um but it, it just i i i felt like as these songs were becoming more completed that those first three songs was just like a great one two three you know hit over the head or something right. you know like it really if you could get into those three songs then i think you're gonna be on for the whole the whole journey of the rest of the album the whole ride sure and i'm so that's it <laughs> i'm glad that you know having been in the band for almost two decades that paul's taking your advice on stuff like this no, I I force it upon him. You know, <laughs> he 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 tries to block me out as much as he possibly can. But you know, as anybody will tell you in my band, I talk and I talk a lot, and I'll beat them over the head with it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as much as I can until until I know that they're at least listening to me. And uh, no, Paul and I are are a good team. We work really well together. You know, sometimes we fight like brothers, but sure. you know. We've also got an understanding and we've got each other's back like brothers as well. So it, it, it really works and we're very fortunate that, we, uh, that we've managed to find the right combination here. You know, I'm the Garfunkel to his Simon. So. <laughs> All right. Well, next time I run into him, I'll make sure he agrees with who was supposed to be who in that analogy. But um... <laughs> So, so yeah, so at this point, let's, uh, let's turn this disc on and listen to the first three tracks off of Homardia by November's Doom. They're called Devil's Light, Plague Bird, and Ghost. <laughs> Well, that was Ghost off of Hamardia, the newest November's Doom CD. The songs before that were Plague Bird and Devil's Light. You're hearing this on WVLP 103.1 FM in Valparaiso, Indiana. Or if you're like, you know, four miles out of town, uh, you'll have to be listening to us on WVLP.org or maybe the TuneIn radio app. And... My guest right now is Larry Roberts, who is one of the guitarists and songwriters from November's Doom. So, Larry, thank you so much for joining me. Glad to be here. Uh, joining me again as we try yeah. to recreate our spectacular original broadcast, which I stupidly forgot to record. Um, <laughs> so if folks are listening out there and the, the, the audio quality of the, the, the conversation here sounds a little weird, it's because we are pre-recording this. This we're both post-recording and pre-recording, uh, so yeah, that there's that a. Work? I don't know, but um, I've seen the flash and the reverse flash both go by in the last few minutes. Um, nice. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I'm, I'm sitting in my basement full of comic books, so it's, oh, it's the well, only that's, thing I'll that's think fitting. about. See, I'm sitting in my uh, in my den room <laughs> full of comic books and action figures and kiss posters so all right well i've got two of those three things i do not have kiss posters um ah what's wrong with you Come on. yeah now you you almost auditioned for kiss right you were at a you were telling me the story about being at an iron maiden concert when you were a kid <laughs> oh man okay see well, you yeah, have to tell no, it again now for all the people yeah, who didn't I'm hear it the first time okay so the, what he's talking about is we were talking earlier about some of the first metal concerts we'd ever been to when we were young and when I was young, the first metal concert that I ever saw was I saw Iron Maiden 
at the Chicago Fest uh, Festival that they had on Navy Pier in Chicago, obviously. And this would have been back around, I think, 82, 81 or 82, somewhere around there. And I actually was there with my family. I wasn't there to see Iron Maiden. I was just there for the day with my family. And we had came across one of those face painting booths. And <laughs> they had, it so happened that one of the, the options you could get was to get Paul Stanley's makeup painted on your face so i chose this wisely being that it was the middle of summer and it was hot as heck out and then as i'm walking around with my paul stanley makeup on <laughs> we come across a live concert that's starting and it ha and we were standing a little ways away but i close enough i could see and hear it just fine and it turns out it was iron maiden and i was completely smitten with it i'd heard of iron maiden at that point but i wasn't like you know, a, a diehard fan or anything yet. And my family let me stand there and watch it for about 20, 30 minutes or so. And then they said, all right, we've, you know, we've had enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, uh, that was, you know, that was uh, pretty awesome. I'm glad I got to see it. I actually do remember it a bit. And uh, I remember how miserable I was in my slowly melting face that was coming off all day with my. <laughs> yeah pseudo black metal makeup going on because with my melted paul stanley face going on it was just not the wisest decision i ever made as a kid but you know yeah so i got to watch my first metal show which was iron maiden uh painted up like kiss i think you may you you may have started something there with all the people looking at your melting makeup and and saying wow that's a good look i want to go try that i mean think of all the genres that you might have spawned just by doing I, that. exactly i think i i think i could have possibly invented the norwegian black metal look even though i'm not norwegian <laughs> and you never know hey you never know somebody could have seen this stupid little blonde-haired kid walking around like that <laughs> in iron maiden show and said you know this makes sense this goes together I doubt it, but, you know. <laughs> well, let's, so, in, you know, it's possible that you had been an influence on other people in terms of their, their makeup and their appearance, um, but you had brought in some samples of music that's been influential to you, and so we've heard the first three November's Doom songs, and before we get back to that CD, let's take a little sample of something that, um, that has been important to you, kind of in your musical growth. And one of the that one of the songs that you've brought in is by Trouble, and it's called right. Black Shapes of Doom. Do you want to say something about that song in particular? Right. Yeah. Uh, Trouble is a band that's from Chicago, and they're one of the forefathers of, you know, again they get kind of labeled as being a doom doom metal doom rock band, but they they were so much more than that. But they definitely did influence a lot of. Uh, darker doomy type of bands they've been man i mean troubles influenced everybody from metallica on down and uh they, they really have look it up and uh trouble especially being from chicago were just such a huge influence on myself and on paul especially when it comes to uh some of their their lyric writing and uh their harmonies and their melodies we've borrowed plenty from them over the years and uh uh, these days, the singer and the bass player from Trouble are in an awesome Chicago band called The Skull, mm -hmm. uh, which features a good buddy of mine, Lothar, from Divinity Compromised on mm -hmm. guitar as well. And uh, they're carrying it on. They're still doing it. They're still great, man. And they still play old Trouble songs. But this is from probably, arguably, maybe my favorite Trouble album, their self-titled one they did in 1990. This song's called Black Sheep's Doom. Okay. And right after that, that was a great intro, and I should go right into that song. But I, yeah, thanks for messing I, it up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted yeah. to point out that after that, we'll play Ever After, which is track four uh, right. off of the new November's Doom CD. Which And currently, that's that's kind of in the running for my favorite song on the disc. Mm, okay. I want to know more about that. Okay. Afterwards. Afterwards. That song was Ever After. That is the fourth track off of Homardia, the brand new November's Doom CD. And before that was Black Shapes of Doom by Trouble. And these songs were either brought to us, uh, provided, or written by Larry Roberts from November's Doom, who's, who's helping create the show tonight. Howdy. 
And we are working our all the way through Hamardia, the new November's Doom CD. So by the end of the show, we will listen to all 10 tracks and we're filling it in with some other songs that Larry selected as sort of uh, examples of his influences or things that were important to him before. Um, yep. And so Trouble was one of those. So before we played those songs, I had mentioned that uh, that Right Now, Ever After is sort of in the running as one of my favorite tracks. And my first time through the disc, Ghost was my favorite track. I was listening to the CD on a road trip, and so I got you know that good 50, 60 minutes of uninterrupted listening. Um, and Ghost was the one that stood out the most. And uh, after a couple of revisits through the CD, I think Ever After is might be creeping up into that top part. And I, I don't really know any one particular reason other than it's it's the one that to me shows the the versatility and the different stylings that you guys have right because it, i yeah it doesn't it's got a lot of it's got a lot of different uh a lot of different moods in that one exactly it's it's not um and when i say this it doesn't mean that, I've, that other ones are but it's not monotonous right it's not just one it hits you in the face right away and keeps up that total intensity the whole time. It's got dynamics to it. It's got variety in the vocals. Well, you know, one thing I think I haven't mentioned before to you or anybody talking about this is that was that song in particular. Um, I mean, there's other songs that feature this as well, but that particular song really was a collaboration of my writing and Vito's writing, the other guitar player. Um, you know, I mean, we always work on each other's songs and add little bits, but, but this one in particular was very collaborative. And I think that when he and I really work together at our best is when we come up with stuff like Ever After. Uh, I think we just have this way of being able to make songs go, again, not to overuse this term, but go on go on a trip you know go on a journey where it takes you through it never loses sight of what the song started as but it just goes through a lot of different feels and emotions and stuff and that yeah i, I really like ever after i i'm really proud of the way that one came out um it's got a solid chorus and it's got one of my favorite guitar solos that i've ever done uh, that guitar solo was a lot of fun to play. Something a little different, <laughs> not the typical for us. <laughs> is it, this is the one uh, that that we talked about before, right? That you know, yeah. you, you you really get to to play above uh, above and beyond the rest of the music in the track for a moment, and so you're working on your your stage poses and <laughs> your, some right. new facial expressions and things like that. Yeah, like, yeah, like I, I've, I, I've said before, I, I like to tell people, I said this, this, this guitar solo was when I get to just pretend I'm like the amalgamation of Neil Sean and George Lynch. You know, that was, that was what I went for. Um, you know, usually my solos have a tendency to, not that they're plain or anything like that, but they have a tendency to just focus more on blending in a little bit more with with the music and the background and stuff they're not necessarily meant to be platforms for here's the lead guitar player now you know i've i'm not that guy i'm not i'm not a big showboat kind of lead guitar player um but i can do some things here and there and when we were writing this song just it it wasn't planned that way but it just the way it came up to that part, the way the music just explodes back in after that quiet bridge, mm -hmm. it just seemed to lend itself to doing something a little bit more epic and grandiose, yeah. you know. Uh, and so I just went for it. I, I said, all right, you know, let me let me delve into my bag of tricks and see what I can do here. And it's it's not a particularly complex guitar solo or anything, but I think just the way it moves and the way it soars um it is a little bit more of a grandstand moment but i don't think it takes away from what's going on behind it or what came before or after it that's the trickiest mm -hmm. part you know no, so i think that, it worked out and that's what i mean that's one of the reasons i dig it is that because your songs don't have that they don't follow that predictable pattern which is you know uh verse chorus verse chorus guitar solo verse chorus and you get to that point where okay it's time for the guitar solo oh look there it is um, there, you know, in most songs, there's going to be times when when Paul isn't singing, 
but you're not having you know the flashy guitar solo it could be that the music is kind of building around what's going on with the guitars but it's yeah. not just that the music is in the background while the guitar gets to show off and this is one of those cases where it does actually to me i heard it it does actually stand out like wow listen to larry get to go on that yeah <laughs> Yeah, and that, and and I mean, I knew when I did it, I knew that's what it was going to be, and I think that that's okay. I think it's okay to do that once in a while, as long as what I'm doing makes sense for the song. Everything I play, whether it's like a little four note bit, you know, or it's something where I'm doing, you know, two hand, you know, mm-hmm. if you know, six finger tapping and things like that, like I do at the end of this song. Is I think any of it is fine as long as it's serving the song for the better and not just serving the ego of the musician. Sure, you know, and that's that's always been my thing. There are loads of amazing shredding guitar players out there in the world now. All you got to do is watch YouTube and you can find them. You know, but it the trick to it is taking those skills and really writing songs and solos and everything that work in in tandem to make something memorable and melodic and that's going to reach people and not just about look look what i can do right you know? uh, now interestingly you mentioned neil sean a couple of minutes ago and yep. one of the other songs that you brought in uh as a sample of one of the people you always enjoyed listening to is by journey yep yeah and i, I think mean, it's time for that one <laughs> yep i think that that's uh Neil Sean's a huge influence of mine and not something people would normally expect to hear from a guy that plays in, you know, dark doom death metal or whatever. But most of my influences aren't, uh, you know, underground metal guitar players or guys like Neil Sean, David Gilmour, Brian May from Queen. Those are my those are my big ones. And Neil, I, the way he structures his solos, his sense of melody while every now and then just letting it totally rip is uh pretty much how i model my playing after and so here's a really good song from 1978 this is a nice heavy but melodic song that i think is a good indication of my in- of how it influenced me this is called la du da by journey Well, that was quite a drastic change of pace in between those two songs. The track you just heard there was Drown the Inland Mirror off of an older November's Doom CD called the Novella Reservoir. And right before that was Journey with La Du Da uh, off of what album? Uh, That was off of Infinity. That was the first album with Steve Perry. Okay. Um, Has Paul ever used La Du Da in any of his lyrics? (laughs) <laughs> i i doubt it but uh uh you know i've i've influenced certain other things there's times when he's thrown little references to stuff that that i'm into i know there was a song that was on novella reservoir that he actually made some references to music from the elder by kiss Ooh. in his lyrics and stuff i'm not gonna i'm not gonna tell anybody <laughs> what song it is if anybody's that curious go listen to the novella reservoir album and see if you can figure out the kiss influence in there i'm sure my drummer gary is just rolling over right now because he he can't stand kiss but what is he <laughs> but he likes disturbed so i mean what does he know so how did how did he get in the door then i mean isn't there some <laughs> kind of like tsa check that you guys do for band you members know, yeah, I mean, it, that's the thing about November's Doom is, I, and as you can, as anybody that listens to this album on this broadcast, I think would be able to, to tell is that we've got a lot of different influences. I mean, to a certain degree, everybody in this band has to be on the same page, obviously. We have to all be walking that same path, but everybody's got different influences and brings different stuff into the band, and... Um, you know, I usually prefer to have my bandmates at least appreciate Kiss a little bit. They don't have to be fans, but I mean, <laughs> Gary's just so good. We kind of let it slide. I, the 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 new metal thing with Gary, though, I, I don't know. I don't know. We we still got to try to beat that out of him, I guess. I <laughs> well, you've you've been successful in keeping away a lot of Vito's influences. Uh, Vito is <laughs> Vito is the other guitar player, um, the bald one. So if you ever see these guys together. 
um, Larry is the one with the hair. And with without trying to cause friction in the band, let's admit it, you, you do have the best hair of anybody in the band. Well, I, man, I still say, or I think about that, I, I think that's debatable. You know, I get a lot of compliments on my hair, but Mike Feldman, you know, that guy's got quite a head of hair. You know, he's... I, it, he's got an impressive impressive head of hair. I mean, the fact that he's the bass player does kind of take away from it a little bit because, I mean, come on, bass player, you know. <laughs> it's only, I mean, what, four strings, really? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're, they, they're, they're there, you know. They, they, <laughs> bass players put the water on the stage for the other members and stuff, you know. They, they print out the set lists and things, but otherwise <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding, man. I We always have to get, I love Mike, we have to always give him a hard time. Um, yeah, Mike's got an impressive head of hair. You know, Paul's still got his hair, yeah. I got hair. And now, now Gary, I mean, he's he's catching up with us finally. He's finally out, out of that, uh, that awkward stage that he used to have. If you, you wanted to see some how much he's evolved go watch the harvest scythe video we put out about five six years ago and he looks like a teenager then and you know now he's turned into a hair farmer like us <laughs> somebody somebody somewhere is gonna be looking for wigs and thank you guys someday from all your <laughs> donations um so i'd mentioned Vito because you had been talking about diversity of of interests that you guys have and bring to the table and it's always fun to talk to Vito because like me he's a big fan of the really you know cheesy keyboard laden power metal as well and so what we're going to do here is listen to the title track from Hamardia which is uh, quite a really nice sweet mellow tune I, I hope I can use the word sweet to describe November's Doom music uh, sure. and right after that we're going to play something kind of silly and it'll be all for Vito uh, absolutely do you want to you want to talk a little bit about the title track before or after we hear it uh we could talk about it a little bit because i know we're going to want to talk about your uh special veto tune afterwards um <laughs> there yeah, won't be much to much say to about s- that <laughs> not too much to say about uh Hamardia other than um i you know it, it was something that I, I actually composed all the music for that. Uh, I was helped out in the studio by uh, playing the keys and stuff by the amazing Ben Johnson, who is also from the band Divinity Compromised from Chicago, a uh, progressive metal band. Uh, ex- excellent job he did on there. I think that that song really more than anything just exemplifies why you can't put a band like us into a specific musical category because i mean it's not even a metal song you you can't even call that song metal it's dark it's moody but it's and it's heavy in its own right but it's it's not metal it's certainly not death metal and i think it shows off some of paul's stronger vocals and everything which you know that we'll talk about more because i think that it comes up even more as the album goes on uh with his strong vocal uh presence on the album and uh i yeah it's it's a cool song it's a nice little break right in the middle of everything before we get back into some super heavy dark stuff again yeah so okay so we'll have the soft we'll have the silly we'll talk about it and then we'll get back into the heavy that sounds like a plan What the hell is it? Hmm. Looks like some kind of lizard. And that little piece of happy joy uh, was by Luca Turilli. The song was called The Ancient Forest of Elves, and it was off the disc King of the Nordic Twilight. So, uh, you know, like Game of Thrones soundtrack stuff right there. And before that was the title track off of Hamardia by November's Doom. And you're hearing this on WVLP, 103.1 FM in Valparaiso, Indiana. And Larry Roberts from November's Doom is in the studio. I'm stalling to give him a chance to dry the sweat off his forehead because he did get up in the studio during that Luca Turilli song and do the happy pagan goat dance of joy while that was going on. So it take, yeah, takes some. Br- I had to. I had to put away. I was getting a little crazy. I had to put my, you know, sheath my sword, put it back in its place. You know, I I started spilling my my horn of beer. <laughs> yeah. Well, come on. It's get time to get down to business now. Come on. Okay. So catch your breath. So the the title track we'd heard off the disc 
uh, Hamardia you had mentioned was was your composition. It featured mostly just you uh, playing acoustic guitar and, and Paul singing with a little bit of sweet keyboard work in there. And one of the other reasons to point that out is just, you know, you personally, you mentioned that when you're not up on stage or in the studio being the angry heavy metal guy, uh, you have a lot of interests in quite a different variety of music. And in fact, you actually get out and perform in other uh, in other ways than just being on the heavy metal stage. And you do actually go out and perform acoustic shows. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit that I, I love all kinds of music. Uh, it's not to say I love all music, but I love all kinds. Um, you know, and I, and that could be everything from old bluegrass music to, you know, classic rock to new wave music of the eighties to even modern stuff. You know, I like some modern pop stuff here and there, uh, songs good. It's good. That's, you know, it doesn't have to be heavy metal to me. And I think one of the most fulfilling parts of being a musician is playing other stuff. You know, I, I'm so grateful. I get to write and record and tour playing my stuff with November's doom, but man it's it's great getting up and playing even if it's just like a little coffee house or a bar or a club or something and playing a you know singing and playing a bob seger song or a roy orbison song you know or i mean because guys like bob seger roy orbison um you know johnny cash uh, the beatles bob dylan those are all huge huge influences on me and so now and then i like to get out you know, mostly just in the region, in northwest Indiana, Chicago, you know, Michigan, whatever. I like to get out and I like to play. Um, sometimes I get up and I play, you know, I've played in cover bands in the region and stuff like Ex-Girlfriend over the years. And, you know, it's been a lot of fun. And it always makes me appreciate when I get out and I do all the, the pop stuff and, you know, the silly rock stuff and everything. I enjoy it a lot, but it always makes me grateful to go back when I need to and and get on that metal stage mm -hmm. and just rock out and you know play my own stuff and then after doing that it's it's a relief to go back and play the cover show or play you know the acoustic stuff and do that it's i'm all about it's got to be a balance for me man you know that's that's the best thing so yeah i mean if anybody that's listening in the area is interested just keep an eye out for me i play I play in the area around here in the whole Midwest Chicagoland area and uh, it's fun, man. And I'm, I'm kind of, people tease me that I'm a little bit of a, of a walking jukebox because uh, people like to go to my acoustic shows and just yell out stuff and see if I know it. And I'd say probably eight out of 10 times I know it. I know some of it. I don't, I can't remember where I put my car keys, but I can remember how to play a song from 35 years ago. It's just, <laughs> it's just one of those things, you know, so. Nice. Um, and so would it be fair to say that, you know, if somebody wanted to contact you about uh, about something like this, you would be open to such a thing? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can find me, you know, on on I'm on Facebook. You can look me up through the November's Doom page. You know, we've got you can if you need to, you can find me through November's Doom dot com or you can find me through the, the Facebook uh, November's Doom 1989. I think it is. Um, or just like look me up on there, uh, you know, keep an eye out for me. Um, I, I'm always open for bookings or doing stuff, you know, within reason. You know, I've, I haven't played any like, uh, you know, five year old birthday parties or anything. Well, wait a minute. Maybe I might have actually. Never mind. <laughs> actually, I might have done that. I, I'll do anything. You so, know, I, never mind. <laughs> so, Paul Stanley makeup and clown makeup, none of this is beneath you. <laughs> I like clowns. I know some people hate clowns. Clowns are cool, man. Cool. And I, I won't put you on the spot, but one of the things I'm thinking is that, uh, you know, I won't say, hey, do you want to do this right now? But one of our other show hosts, John King, he does a show on Thursdays called Living It Up Radio, and he features local artists. And a lot of times he has people just bring their instruments into the studio and play a couple songs. So, oh, um, yeah, if I'd if, love to do something like okay. that, you know, because, I mean, I could do my own stuff. I could do. I could do other people's stuff. I do, you know, I, yeah, I love singing and playing. I, I, if anybody's curious, I think it's even archived. One time the November's Doom guys came out to one of my, uh, one of my local 
uh, solo acoustic shows, and I'm pretty sure Paul streamed like the whole thing on the November's Doom Facebook page, and that was <laughs> that got an interesting reaction, you know, because there's all these like, you know heavy metal death metal fans from all over the world and they're watching me up there playing like traveling wilburys covers and stuff and i think people were a little little confused like why are we seeing this and it's like eh, you know because that's me man i like and everybody in november's doom is that way nobody in november's doom is a strict metal fan we right. all love other stuff gary loves jazz and blues and you know, Vito loves like shoegaze and soundtracks, and Paul's really into Peter Gabriel and The Doors and Greg Laswell and singer songwriter stuff. And that's a that's all important to us, even yeah. if it's not real obvious. But you know, we have all sorts. Of, this next song we're gonna play by us has some non-metal influences in it. But it's still heavy, and lest lest anybody think that they're listening to the wrong show now, this is mostly metal. Uh, mostly because sometimes you hear things in it that aren't, like, you know, Journey that we listened to a while ago, but we've been away from the heavy for a while, so we're swinging back in. We'll actually listen to two tracks off of the the Hamartia CD, um, Apostasy and Miasma, and are there, are there good good bits of information for folks as they listen to these tracks? Sure. Well, like I was just saying with Apostasy, I mean, that, that song... Ironically, it's one of the heaviest, more aggressive songs on the album, but the original influences for me for that song weren't necessarily from like a metal uh, viewpoint. I, I was very much drawing from um, kind of like a stoner rock kind of vibe with mm -hmm. that. I sort of hate to use that tag because I know that draws up certain visions, but to me, you know, I, I was really kind of drawing from the influence of stuff like, uh, you know, Pentagram and Sir Lord lord baltimore and things like that as long as well as like queens of the stone age um that sort of thing even even foo fighters i mean you know paul and i love foo fighters and that's influenced us in the past too so we kind of it came initially from that but by the time it went through the november's doom filter you know the and everybody adds their thing to it at the end of the day, the song winds up just sounding like us, you know, it, and it doesn't necessarily sound like those influences anymore. But the influence is definitely there, and it's, and especially on a song like this. So I think this is a good rocking tune. Those two songs you just heard here on Mostly Metal were Miasma and Apostasy off of the new disc, Hamartia, by November's Doom. Larry Roberts from November's Doom has brought this disc in to share it with us all the way through. We've heard the first seven tracks. Are you tired yet? <laughs> no, I'm doing okay. Hanging in there. Okay. Um, let's play a pair of songs here. We'll, we'll do like we did before and pair them up. Uh, one of them will be another song off of the November's Doom disc, track eight, which is Zephyr. Uh, and then also another one of your tracks that you brought in is just a sample of things that influenced you as as you've been, you know, going through your career. And it will be a track by Syndrome called Cathedral of Ice. Yeah. Well, first of all, as far as uh, talking about Zephyr first, I mean, the interesting about a song like Zephyr uh, is that that is one of three tunes on this album that features uh, recorded vocals for the first time by Paul's teenage daughter, Rhiannon Kerr. Um, as you know, Ken, you, you've seen her, mm -hmm. you know, at our shows and everything. You remember when she was just a little thing. Oh, yeah. You know, throwing the horns uh -huh, at, at daddy's uh -huh. shows and stuff. Um, you know, she is a budding singer, and she takes after her dad, and she's actually really developed quite a voice on her. And... The main reason why we decided to feature her on the album for the first time was because, um, as a lot of people that know us probably know, Paul has a tendency to write very personal lyrics. Uh, he decided a long time ago he didn't want to do the uh, typical rhymy heavy metal poetry about Satan and hell and all these other silly things that a lot of metal bands sing about, and he decided this was going to be an avenue for him to... Uh, express himself in a more personal, uh, sometimes very naked, bare kind of way to people, which can be even a little uncomfortable, but, I, you know, it's effective 
and it, it definitely makes us stand out. On this album, he continues to write personally, but on songs like Zephyr, he decided to do something a little different and actually write from the perspective of people close to him as well as his own feelings and and a song like Zephyr uh, along with Miasma and Ever After uh, take kind of a perspective of not just coming from him but also coming from his daughter and other uh, people close to him about personal subjects personal tragedies you might remember that on the End of Night's Requiem Infernal album, Paul sang a song about his father passing away. Yes. And that was the fifth day of March, and which is a great song uh, I'm very proud of. And he did that sort of thing again this time, except instead of it just being about himself, he looked at things from Rhiannon's point of view as well. So it, it since he was kind of putting her words to paper so to speak it just made sense for her to sing along with him and sing some of those words as well and it works really really good and i keep teasing paul because he always tell likes to tell people about what a better singer she is than him and i take every advantage to tease him and tell him how right he is about that <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I we that's that's november's doom anybody that ever listened to our old podcast knows that we just we just rip on each other nonstop. But um, <laughs> in all seriousness, though, yeah, so this song, and I think what's great about a song like Zephyr is the juxtaposition of these really heartfelt, uh, deep, emotional vocals that are coming from this young girl mixed with extremely aggressive, heavy, dark music that's still melodic. But uh, I really think we, we hit the mark with a song like Zephyr. And then we'll also listen to Syndrome, Cathedral of Ice. Yeah, that one, um, that's a big, another big influence for myself and for Paul. Uh, it's another Chicago band. We, you know, I'd love to give as much attention as possible to the Chicago bands because many of them never got the uh, just due that they were deserved. And um, Syndrome is one of the biggest ones. They Anybody in the metal underground that's, you know, that knows about stuff like that old old classic influential stuff will know that syndrome uh was the band that never was they did a couple of really amazing demos back in the late 80s early 90s they influenced everybody from carcass and at the gates and napalm death on through to bands like us and um we've continued to take influence from them paul especially vocally was very influenced by troy from syndrome and I, I, you, you know, you listen to this music now, and I think it still sounds great, you know, 30, 25, 30 years later. And uh, just real quick, anybody, if you hear this and you like it, they just recently re-released all this stuff on a CD called Resurrection by Syndrome, and it's out on Century Media. It just came out uh, about eight, eight months ago or so, and it's, uh, it sounds great, remastered and everything. And this is the original demo version, and man it still sounds as good or better than some of the stuff i hear coming out today so big influence on us check it out this is cathedrals of ice by syndrome spider-man spider-man does whatever a spider can that track you just heard was cathedral of ice by syndrome and before that was zephyr track number eight off of hamartia the new november's doom cd this is mostly metal i'm ken the metal professor and sitting with me is Larry Roberts from November's Doom, who is guiding us through this disc and giving us a lot of insight to the songs. And we have two tracks left to squeeze in before the end of the hour. And those are track nine called Waves in the Red Cloth and track 10 called Borderline. And uh, Borderline is nine minutes long, which okay. is the longest song on the disc and possibly one of the longest songs in November's Doom's entire career. It's one of them, yeah. Um, I think Last God on The Knowing was like ten and a half minutes long, uh, so that might be the longest one we've ever done. But uh, And I wrote that one too, so it's always my fault that, that the long songs are me. <laughs> um, I just go on and on. But uh, yeah, Borderline is 
possibly, uh, I'd say Borderline is definitely one of my favorite songs we've ever written mm-hmm. in the band. Yeah, I'm And gonna... Waves in the Red Cloth, too. I really, I, I think we ended just as we started the album really solidly, like I said, with those first three songs. I feel really strongly about the way we ended this album. Yeah, so I'm going to interrupt here real quick. You can hear this, maybe. That's this noise. That's my that's my stack of November's Doom CDs. Um, so I was as you were talking, I was I was starting to flip through to try to find the knowing and see if they actually had the uh, the the track times printed on the say the liner or the disc or the the liner. I didn't see it, but just real quick, I'm going to flip through these things. Amid its hallows, mirth of sculptured ivy and stone flowers uh, to welcome the fade, and then. Um, I've got reflecting in gray dusk in between to welcome the fading oh, yeah, and knowing. I yeah. think I you've got you've actually got that. That's very rare. Is that in the right place, or did I just kind of put that in between there randomly? Right, no, that's right actually yeah. It was it was a mid, and then sculptured ivy, then the knowing, then to welcome the fade, and then we did reflecting in gray dusk was a rare kind of like sampler greatest hits kind yeah. of thing, <laughs> as if we had hits. Um, but, you know, it was a thing that we did uh is like a little tour sampler back mm-hmm. when we went on our north american tour back in 2004 we went out with agalock and the gathering and we gave those away there was only a couple hundred or so of those printed you've got a rare one there all right good for me i don't remember where it came from um <laughs> i hope i didn't steal it from somebody but yeah i was looking at the knowing and the the track titles are printed on the disc but not the times and i don't want to get out the the liner notes and start flipping through that um, and then the, the discography goes on, you know, through through those, and then Pale Haunt Departure, The Novello Reservoir, Into Night's Requiem Infernal, Aphotic, um, Bled White, and Hamardia. And Hamardia. I was worried I was missing one, because I know at least one of these I also have digitally, and I couldn't re- remember if I had one only digitally, so it wasn't in my little stack. But Right. Um, no, that should be it. So. I mean, that's all the major releases. Oh, how about that? My collector mentality paid off. <laughs> um, speaking of hits, right? So, it, you know, I, I don't know that singles are a thing, you know, in this genre or if they ever were. But, you know, if you were going to, you know, do a single kind of release or a video on one of the songs on this album, uh, which one might it be? Well, you know, as, as you know, we did the little, uh, I guess it counts as a music video, although it's kind of combining a music video with a. Uh, a lyric video Mm -hmm. which is usually a little more of a generic kind of thing but we we did we did something a little more unique with the one we did for zephyr um one of the songs we just listened to uh we did that but we do plan on trying to do at least one more music video for a proper music video for this album it's hard to say man because i gotta be honest with you just about everybody i talk to not only the guys in the band and the people at the record label but you know reviewers fans friends everybody seems to have a different opinion and this album <laughs> go figure this, uh, yeah well but i mean this album in particular it seems like almost any song could be that way and that's uh that's a really proud achievement of ours you know i don't think there's much on this album that in my opinion would really be considered filler you know, I right. mean, we we it's not that we ever try to write filler music, but it sometimes it just ends up that way. Certain songs outlast others. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm sure that's going to be the case on this album too. But as it stands right now, I don't think we'll be doing a video for Borderline because it's so long. Although it could be cool. Um, you know, I think songs like Plague Bird, songs like Ghost, I I think those are those are good songs. If we did a video for the next song, Waves in the Red Cloth, I foresee having Lorenzo Lamas riding on a motorcycle through the desert to fit that, <laughs> to, to fit that intro that I put on there. That's That intro is definitely showing a little bit of my, my southern rock influence. <laughs> nice. And one of the other problems with, with doing a video of Borderline was that you'd have to pay the travel costs for several other people, right, to come in and reproduce their parts, I guess, depending on how you would do the video. You want to run down that roster? Right, yeah, well that's the other thing. These last two songs on this CD feature um, a whole a host of uh, guest uh, appearances. Uh, on Borderline, we have, uh, once again, he's he usually tries to help us out in some way or another because he's such a uh, kindred spirit with us and has worked with us for so long. We have Dan Swano from Sweden singing vocals on the album. 
Ska. He does a little bit of backing vocals with Paul. And we also have Burnt from Suspiria, uh, a great, uh, great uh, European metal band that we had the pleasure of playing with last year when we did the 70,000 Tons of Metal cruise and made friends with him. And it just worked out. Paul had an idea, reached out to him. He did it, came out great. So having Paul's voice as well as Burnt and as well as Dan just, I mean, you know, you can hear it, the proofs in the pudding. I mean, it sounds amazing. And then in addition to that, uh, we have a special guest on the song Waves in the Red Cloth. Uh, we actually have our longtime buddy, Andy from My Dying Bride, playing guitar on the outro part of that song. Um, it just seemed to make sense. A lot of people have heard it and said, oh, well, it sounds like My Dying Bride. No, it doesn't. <laughs> But, you know, we, we hear that all the time. But, um, it, it, you know, my actual influence for that song was that I was listening to the Melvins a lot. And I wanted to and I was picturing if the Melvins wrote a doom death song, but being influenced by Twisted Sister at the same time. Oh, wow. I, yeah, I know. Everybody's going to go, well, I don't hear it. But I'm telling you right now, <laughs> that's that's exactly where it came from. I'm not even kidding. Someday um, somebody write a master's thesis about it in a music program. <laughs> there you go but uh, you know it came up you know paul and andy have been very good friends for many years now i mean we started out at the same time as my dying bride did and so we've been friends for years uh, just corresponding and we've hung out with them and so on but if i we never played with them and then finally this time around it just came up about hey let's you know let's let's do something together so I had this song, and it just seemed like it made the most sense, um, and it needed a little extra something, and Andy came up with this great little guitar bit that he threw in there that it's so, so obviously Andy from My Dying Bride when you hear it, you know, it's, sure. it's got their touch, and it doesn't sound like anything else we've done. So, yeah, it was great, man. It was, it, it's, it's so awesome that we've gotten to work with people like that and getting to work with people like Chris Wisco, you know, who engineers and produces our stuff, working with Dan Swano all these years, who mixes and masters our stuff. It, it really does take everybody to make this what it is. And uh, we're, we're so, you know, to use a, a, a term, I, we're so blessed and grateful to have the opportunity to work with all these brilliant people the way we have and be able to make you know a complete package like we have now with Hamartia so ending the album with that huge collaboration between the three vocalists it's mm -hmm. like the three tenors of death metal you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just you know we couldn't end on a better note awesome okay well speaking of ending then we'll uh we'll let this this show and this disc kind of right off into the sunset lorenzo lamas on a motorcycle style um with waves in the red cloth and borderline and we'll just play this out till the end of the show i want to thank you so much for um for being very patient with me uh we mentioned this at the beginning of the show and hinted at it a couple of times this is actually only partially a rebroadcast of sunday night's program normally sunday night is recorded from 8 to 10 for mostly metal and then rebroadcast wednesday night Larry came out all the way from Chicago, was kind enough to sit through a two-hour show. It was awesome, uh, and I had forgotten to hit record. And so we didn't have a rebroadcast, and so Larry is gracious enough to spend some time uh, on Skype uh, this afternoon, yeah. uh, recovering some of our conversation, and in, most importantly, getting to make sure people are hearing the stories in the background to, to these songs. So you, sir, are good people for being willing to do this. I feel like we need to. I need to do my uh, my old uh, channel nine or channel eleven like uh, announcer guy. You know, going. You are listening to a rebroadcast of a previous <laughs> program. I'm like I, gr growing up with that. <laughs> I'm, I'm. You know what? When I make this audacity file, I'm going to cut out that clip and I'm going to start putting that at the beginning of every one of my rebroadcasts. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get royalties because we don't get money at this station. That's okay. Um, I'm just imitating the guy that yeah. you did at the <laughs> back in the, in the 70s anyway. I'm an, right. old, I'm an old TV junkie, so, sure. you know. And just, okay, just one last time. Um, did we miss anything? Is there anything important you want people to know about the disc? And also, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, drop you a note uh what are some of the social media type ways they can do that yeah i mean anybody if you you know 
I, I, I can't emphasize enough. I know everybody likes to download stuff, and we're happy to stream the album here for you like this so you can hear it. But if you dig it and you want to hear it over and over again, man, it, it, it's, for a band like ours, it helps immensely to go out and buy it. Or even if you just buy a track or two on iTunes or whatever, uh, all our stuff can be found on iTunes, can be found at Amazon. Uh, you can even still occasionally find our actual CDs in places like FYE and stuff like that. You know, please pick it up. Check out those uh, those places to get the digital stuff. You can order from us directly at www.novembersdoom.com. There's no apostrophe in Novembers. It's just one word of November's Doom. And uh, you can order stuff from there. You can look us up on Facebook. Uh, we're at Twitter. We're, we're all over the place. We're easy to find. And we're more than happy to talk to people directly and correspond with them we're not rock stars we love to meet people and talk to people and help them out and we appreciate everybody's support and guys like you ken and everybody else that have supported us over the years super grateful all right thank you so much and again the last two tracks on hamartia that we're going to listen to waves and the red cloth and borderline and make sure to support november's doom catch them the next time it's possible uh, on a show and tune in next week for more Mostly Metal. <laughs>